uh, today on the Mongols and wrapping up the Mongols. Uh, in this little uh, short screencast blurb, uh, we're going to go into some other things to, that we didn't get to go into with the Mongols, uh, some interesting facts, just kind of some fun things to know about uh, Mongols and their, their impact on things. So um, starting off, uh, we want to start with something that's uh, a little bit more positive here on things uh, with the Mongols. Um, you should have seen some positive things that the Mongols did in their uh, in the in the judgment activities we did. Uh, but in case you didn't, this will go over. Uh, this will cover a little bit of it. Um, but this is a completely different article. This is from History Extra, and it it goes into Genghis Khan and his life and what they did and and why he possibly killed so many people, as well as was that out of the ordinary for the time. And that's one of the big things I want to highlight with this. And I think. Uh, all of us teachers have hopefully uh, kind of done that or brought that up points if you were in classes that um, it, it's really tough for us to not judge things by our 21st century minds. But at times when we go back and look at these people in the past and their actions and what they're doing, we got to remember they are not us. Their morals are different than us. The norm is different from what we have for a norm. And so when we're talking about the Mongols potentially killed 40 million people or so throughout all their fighting, yeah, that's bad. That's a lot of people. Uh, it, it's such a big number that it's hard for us to fathom. But um, it's it's not out of the ordinary for the tactics that were done back in the day and, and how they treated things. Um, it is more than anyone else did back in the past. Uh, I won't excuse Genghis Khan for that or anything like that, but there was a practical reason behind it. And, and this article goes into a good bit of that in that here's what you got to think about. The Mongols are maybe about 2 million people. Okay, from the plains uh, in, in Central Eurasia. So actually, let's bring that up for a second so you guys can see that. Uh, what we're talking about here is if we go to Google Maps, uh, it's going to zoom in on where we're at in the world. Uh, so we're going to zoom out from there, hopefully. So there's us in Iowa. We're going to zoom out and we're going to go over here to Mongolia. And we'll see it show up. This is, this is where they're coming from, the modern-day uh, st country of uh, Mongolia. These are where the Mongols are coming from. Uh, there are a bunch of different clans united, as we've seen, and they number about 2 million people, and they're going to conquer uh, China here. They're going to conquer uh, some northern parts of India and Pakistan. They're going to push all the way here, uh, and they're going to push into conquering all of Kazakhstan uh, and pushing into Ukraine and, and Russia here. And so they are absolutely, it's, it's an absolutely huge uh, region uh, that they will control. Uh, largest contiguous, which means it's the largest land mass that, that continues to go. There's no breaks in it. Uh, empire in history. And so um, there's a reason why they're were brutal. And that is because to control that many people, you're going to have to make yourself known to uh, everyone not to mess with you. And your goal is going to be able to fight as little as possible. And so if you can make a, um, oh, what's the word I want to say? If you can make an example of certain groups that resist you, um, you can get other groups to fall in line to not fight against you. And so if you go and destroy one city, the next city down the line that you get to, they're going to be like, ah, you, we'll, we'll go to the peaceful method. And if you did things peacefully with the Mongols, things usually went pretty well with you. You were showered with gifts. Uh, you were brought into the trade. Uh, yes, you had to pay some taxes to them and stuff like that, but it was not you, your whole city got destroyed. Um, if you resisted the Mongols, you faced major amounts of destruction, which we've seen. And um, you can argue that that's excusable for back in the day because that was not abnormal to, to destroy cities, to kill lots of people. Um, there are plenty of examples that they go into with China where most of this happened. Uh, you could argue, I think they argue in here, uh, I'll see if I can find it here real quick scrolling through, but I think they argue that like 20 to, uh, 20 million or so people would be responsible for, or would be, uh, how many the Mongols killed or so. And I mean, these are, um, uh, some of these are, are much later times, but like the An Lushan revolt uh, led to possibly 26 million people, uh, million people dying in China. Uh, and that's uh, a few hundred years in uh, before the Mongols came about in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, you can see it happening after with the Taiping Rebellion with 30 million people. So um, when you have a super dense population like you do in China, and it's uh, very precariously sent or, or centered around um, food coming from the south to the north, and that gets disrupted, you're going to want to have a lot of people die in the cities when fighting happens, but also you're going to have a lot of people starve afterwards because there aren't people to work the fields or they can't get the food up there. And so, yeah, it's bad. 
But anytime there's fighting in China, there's bad things. And I'm not trying to excuse it. Um, but the, also thing, the, the other thing to bring up with this, um, that they bring up, is we actually don't know what the population of China was. Um, it, it could be as low as 66 million, and it could be as high as 230 million. Now, if you're talking about 66 million people, now we're talking that he killed somewhere around a third of the population, which is huge and unfathomable. Um, it, it's still unfathomable to think that he killed 10% of the population, but if you're talking about 200 million people, uh, that's a lot different, okay? Still bad, but <clears throat> that's one thing I want to emphasize coming into this is to explain why the Mongols were a little bit brutal um, is because they're such a small group trying to conquer all these places and do it with the, the least amount of troops damaging, uh, losing the least amount of troops and getting the most people on board without fighting back. Um, and... Um, yeah, I want to bring up that it's just, it's not uncommon for, for history to see this many things dying. It is very uncommon for us today unless we want to look at World War II, uh, where you have many more people than this dying in, in, in the whole of the conflict. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's just kind of one thing there. So this is one article. If you want to take a deeper dive into it, uh, jump into it, and, and you'll see some of those arguments of why they're not so outlandish uh, for what was going on. Um, it is bad. I mean, from a modern perspective, from really any perspective, it is bad that that many people died. But it's not out of the realm of possibility for back then. It's just Genghis Khan did it to a much larger scale than anyone else had done it before. Um, so that's that. Uh, if you want to take a deeper look at that article, great. Uh, if you want to use it for evidence in the um, uh, in the assessment you guys are going to do, you're more than welcome to use it. I would I would suggest using it if you like some of the things that are brought up, if you're going to defend the Mongols, or even if you're going to attack the Mongols with, with some of the uh, estimates on, on death they cause in certain regions. Just you're going to need to go and find those in, in the article here. Okay. Uh, the second and third articles that we're going to go, and then I'm going to show you are, are um, not dealing with people necessarily. Well, actually, the second one does deal with people in that... Um, but it focuses more on the environmental impact that Genghis Khan had. And it was that he's like a great environmentalist. Uh, and I'm saying that with sarcasm. Some of you guys that have me in class will know that even though I, everything is said in the same monotone, that is that is a sarcastic thing. Um, but uh, those of you that don't have me might not see it that way. So uh, I am being sarcastic there. But uh, he is a great environmentalist because uh, we found out that he was fighting global warming before we started to fight global warming and, and climate change and all that stuff because uh, of all the damage that he did, all the killing, uh, he dropped the carbon levels across the world uh, by 0.1, um, which is significant. Um, it, it is equivalent in this article, they say, to uh, one year of us currently running gasoline and stuff like that. So he, he took in, uh, he led to as much carbon sequestration or the absorption of carbon that uh, it makes up for one year of us running our cars and stuff like that. Now, does that significantly change things in like the, the environment of the world and stuff like that? No, he'd have to keep that up for a long time to actually like make major climate change type type things happen. But, <coughs> excuse me there for that. But um, it's it's just kind of a, a fun article bringing up that um, – that uh, some of the unintended consequences of of what happened when you when you go on long conquest and, and a lot of people die, uh, and maybe I shouldn't say the term fun there, but it's it's interesting in that you you can see this happen, and then when you bring in the Black Death with that, it it, it led to lower carbon levels. Um, now that's all going to get thrown away when we get to the Industrial Revolution. We go way beyond that, but uh, this is showing that maybe maybe Genghis Khan was like an environmentalist and stuff like that. Um, so if you want to see more on that article, uh, it's right here. Uh, and then uh, last one also deals with the environment, but more on the negative sides of the environment. Uh, and this is going to deal a little bit more with Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson uh, in China. But uh, because the Mongols were so focused on making money, uh, especially silver to keep the, the economic engines running and stuff like that, uh, they would uh, harvest as much as the silver and other metals that they need uh, as they can. And they didn't care because they didn't know about environmental damage from that stuff and how deadly it was. Like, they didn't know that lead was poisonous, but they made it so that you have, in some areas, four times the amount of lead in the water, which uh, could destroy some of the ecosystems, is going to, if people are getting their water from there, is going to lead to major um, developmental issues uh, mentally. Uh, with those people because that's uh, lead causes um, major damage with that. Uh, that's where, if you want to relate that today, uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, I don't know how much of an issue it is still today, but really uh, the idea of lead piping is is an issue all across our country and that we've got these lead pipes. But as long as the right water runs through uh, and doesn't take away the layer, we're fine. 
But if that layer gets taken away, which is what happened in Flint and why their water got poisoned by lead, um, then uh, you run into the problem of, of ingesting lead, which leads to developmental disability, leads to more uh, aggression in people because uh, it, it affects that area of the brain. So um, this is showing you a, an environmental example of the destruction of the Mongols. So it's not just people-wise, it's also uh, environmental in what they do and trying to harvest as much silver as possible. And so um, you can see uh, down here, well, the title tells you it's, it's four times, uh, but they bring up like a hundred... Um, uh, right here in this part, uh, they talk about it's uh, 119 micrograms uh, of lead in that sediment, which means that's how much was going through the water or, or maybe it was even higher in the water at that time. So this is a huge amount because just a um, uh, 100 years later, a little over 100 years, it, it drops to 30 micrograms after the Mongols are gone. So this is mainly, we can attribute it to the Mongols and um, it's, it, it, it's pretty bad. Uh, and that happening uh, for the environmental damage. So if you wanted to go into an argument against the Mongols, uh, talking about their environmental destruction, this would give you something there for that. You'll want to dive into it a little bit more to understand the full argument that they're making here, but uh, this gives you another option for uh, the assessment, which we'll be rolling out tomorrow. So that's kind of everything there. Um, again, uh, hopefully you're able to explore uh, that, uh, and you can hopefully get some of those things we just brought up into the positives or negatives here on uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongols.